So this week, uh, we have another guest on our very exciting basketball podcast, uh, Tori. Uh, welcome, and thank you for coming online to have a chat to us. Thank you for having me. And uh, I guess Tori, um, again, is one of my ex-players. Uh, it's great. One of the fun things about coaching many kids throughout the years when they're growing up and learning about basketball is, you know, getting to sort of connect with them a bit later as well. And uh, obviously, I coached Tori for two seasons uh, at a rep level. Uh, when you were playing, I think, under 14s and under 16s. You know, that was a few years ago yeah. now. Uh, and uh, obviously, from what I understand, you played two years of rep. And uh, before that, you obviously played about, well, all up now, I guess, that you probably played about 17 years of domestic basketball. So you've definitely got a lot of basketball under your belt. So it'd be really good to for us to sort of pick your brains a little bit about your basketball experience. Yeah. No, I've, I feel like I've been playing my whole life just until two months ago so perfect yeah all right well we'll um we'll probably hear a little bit about the journey along the way but obviously the first thing that we want to know is how did this journey begin so what got you into it or how did you start learning basketball um well at first it was just more of a social cultural thing um my mum's Armenian and there was an Armenian club basketball club at Waverley that um ever anyone and all, all the Armenians would join. And so my mum and my cousins, we all joined that. And at a young age, I would just start with the trainings. And then when I was able to play the games, then I played the games. And it wasn't until I then, I, I stuck with that same team until I was in the rep team as well. Um, so it was just, it started off really, really casual. And it was just, something to do so my mum could see her aunties and and all that sort of stuff um but then it got to yeah I I, it, I, I started liking it a bit more um and so joined a rep team so you're saying all Armenians came together to just play basketball together is that what happened well essentially it was just um a very small community in here and mainly in Sydney as well and they all got together um and they would play, the team is Hominet Men, and yep. they would have these, like, Armenian basketball festivals called the um, Nava Such Young Games in Melbourne and Sydney, and they would chop off every two years. And it was quite a, like, culture and atmosphere, so my mum was pretty eager to get to get me and my sister into that. Um, yeah, so not it's not compulsory if you're Armenian to play basketball, but... It was pushed. Oh, it, it sounded really <laughs> exciting. I, I guess uh, I don't know that any Chinese organizations are playing basketball as a group. <laughs> I guess yeah. that is uh, you know, <laughs> it, really interesting to hear that. Um, I guess sort of curious, sort of obviously you went from um, you were playing at home that men, obviously with that group, like you said, all the way through to when you started playing rep when I was coaching you on the 14s and under 16s at that point. How did you sort of find that transition, I guess, from domestic to rep basketball? You know, how did you? Yeah. Um. I found it very, very intense. Um, it went from one of the main reasons I then joined Interrep as well was because it was very, it started to get very sexist as you got older. They were just like, it was just the boys playing and we were just there, I don't know, to get our steps up. Um, and so all of a sudden to, to want the ball and then to actually go and get it was very different. It was all of a sudden like you're, taken as equal um you have to do like equal trainings and yeah even even just the training alone it was a lot more intense I think we just would run around the court and dribble the ball a little bit but actually having drills and plays that you would run through um having it a lot more structured I feel like just made it feel intense but definitely better uh I, I actually want to do a follow up on that one real quick. So are you yeah. kind of alluding to the fact that domestic basketball, the training was looser for females or are you ref referencing the rep? Sorry. I'm referencing the domestic, well, I thought the domestic games um, for me were a lot more sexist just in the, well, oh, sorry, it was also um mixed but then going into rep it was rep and fe um, females only and so for me there was a big change in that um, but I know if you're going from it would I would have a, a completely different experience if I was going from a 
women's only domestic to women's only rep. So I've right. kind of got a biased view in that sense. Um, but that was just one of the things I noticed was we got a lot more ball time, court time, everything, and it was more structured. I guess so. You I feel like this is, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I interrupt. I guess just so you're clear, you were playing the Saturday mixed um, uh, domestic competition because obviously I think there was the Tuesday night girls competition, wasn't it? And that's just all girls, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, and then with when I joined rep, that's when I realised what, like how different playing in an all girls team is. Um, and so when I was in the rep team, I then changed domestic teams. So I then went, I actually like, much prefer all women's. Um, and so I made both domestic and rep women's only. Mm-hmm. What age did you make that decision? Just out of curiosity. I think around 15, 16. It would have been halfway through the first year of rep. Yeah, wow. Okay, so even up until the age of like 13, 14, you were playing against against guys. Yeah. Yeah, wow, okay. Yeah, I later went back to mixed, but I think definitely when I was when I was younger, I was very much just like, oh, this is unfair, and then would walk off. Whereas as I got older, I was like, well, no, I can be more assertive and I'm not too much like I can't ask a guy for the ball. (laughs) So (laughs) it just changes. Yeah, well, I guess um, I guess that kind of details into this next question where, you know, potentially there was some pressure put on you at one point to, to choose another sport. Um, and netball is the one that pops to mind quite often uh, for females. That seems to be the pathway. But, uh, you know, how did, how did you know that netball wasn't it and basketball was? Um, well, I went another, another little size. I went to an all-girls school and there was a very – like big push to join a netball team. There was, there were basketball teams. It was very much like, this is the sport to be in if you're at my school. And so I tried it for a little bit, but I think because I had been so engraved in how I played basketball um, and how physical and in your face it was and just fast paced. Netball is still fast paced, very physical, but such a different type and almost too similar that I would get them confused like I was dribbling the ball in basketball sorry in netball but then I'd stand like three feet away in basketball so they didn't really complement each other at all the only thing was I was like I couldn't you know I was okay at passing and shooting but the actual game it was just meddling up both of my both of my um skills and so I just thought I'd stick with basketball yeah, where I know makes sense, I guess, because like you said earlier, you've you've been playing your basketball since you were like about five years old. So I guess yeah. if you've got all those years of basketball reps and then trying to, like you said, remember which game you're playing, the rules, I guess, you know, they're very very similar. So um, yeah. yeah, it's an interesting piece of feedback there. I guess uh, I guess in regards to feedback, I guess over the years, obviously through domestic and and obviously I guess a couple scenes that rep. What's probably one of the most valuable pieces of advice that you might have received from from coaching or from your parents, maybe, or, or someone else out there that you, sort of really sticks in your mind? Um, I feel like it was when I started rep and it was really just the mentality that you're only going to get back what you put in. Because um, I feel like with domestic training being a lot more slack and relaxed and you're just there to you know, get your blood moving. I do think it was a lot clearer for me that the harder we trained in training, the better the outcome was, which I think just can get, you know, moved across all areas in life. Um, So I think think that was pretty, one of my biggest lessons. I I think you just jogged my memory there. Correct me if I'm wrong here, Tori, but I believe I brought us in an hour early on a Sunday morning, wasn't it? (laughs) For for training. I I think we started training an hour early on Sunday mornings at 7 a.m., wasn't it? (laughs) I remember now. That's right. I remember that. Yeah, and I used to, yeah, I used to go to sleep in my uniform because I was like, I'm not not getting up early to change. And so my dad would wake me up and I'd get my shoes on and I'd walk out of the door. I think we were the most dedicated time. We were the most dedicated rep team that season, I think. You know, we put in the extra yeah. hours. I think, yeah, that was I just jogged my memory there that you said that. But. Yeah. 
I guess obviously, you know, segueing from the training, yeah. uh, you know, the moments before the game or the day before the game, you know, game preparation is huge. And I think we talked a lot about that both in our fantasy drafting, but also, uh, you know, with, with real people. So how important is game preparation for you? It is very important. Um, I think, sad, not sadly though, the only preparation I would really do is day of. Like throughout the week, I wouldn't be setting things up. I would just live life normally. But the day or the night, you know, starting from the night before, I feel like just what I ate um, because the worst feeling is when you have energy but you have a stitch, Um, like just what you're eating before the game. And I find music very motivating. So I think the drive to the game or whatever, I would just blast music and then I'd be ready to smash the courts. (laughs) Very dramatic. (laughs) What's on your playlist? Honestly, anything and everything. Just, I just really, any music gets you fired up. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, just any any fast paced music, even even if it's sad and emotional. I don't know, just high high emotive music, um, just gets gets me revved up. <laughs> Besides music, I guess, do you have any other sort of superstitions or you know game preparations um, that leading to a game? You know what you eat. And not what you really, to? to be honest. I know there are people. Yeah, not not really. I know there are some people with like lucky socks or before they shoot, they dribble it, you know, five times or, but I really, I didn't, I never have had one. So I don't know. I feel like, I feel like that, that just gets down to my training. It was like, well, whatever I've put into my training the week before, I can wear the luckiest socks in the world. But if I haven't gone to training and put in the hours there, it's not going to, it's not going to save me. I guess you know the music is one thing but are you thinking about the game actively while the music's playing are you running through maybe some of the sets you've been practicing at training or some of the opponents you're going to be facing or is it just very reactive for you I feel it's just it's very reactive during I wouldn't really go through the plays that much when I was listening to music because I feel like I don't know, that would just distract me. I would, if anything, throughout the week, I'd kind of just be thinking about the game and, oh, you know, there was this new play um, that we've learned of this new drill or whatever. But, no, it would just just be fully fully immersed into the song. Um, and even, even, like, listening to it as you're walking into the stadium. Like, I feel like just being in my own head with music for as long as possible before the game would always have a better outcome. Obviously, earlier tonight when we um, connected, you sort of mentioned that you only played those two seasons for his rep that I had the opportunity of coaching you. I'm a little bit curious, I guess, um, a little bit both sides. How come you didn't play rep any earlier? And why did you stop playing rep after those two seasons only? I hadn't actually really heard or knew much about rep at all. And I think it was my dad's friend's daughter who had played rep and he had gone into work and was like, my daughter's playing rep. It's fantastic. And so my dad was like, stuff the Armenian team. We need to get you into rep. And I was like, oh my God. Okay. And so that's when it started. Um, And then I think towards the end, I was just, I loved it, but I I got a feel of this is, it's not going to be a career or I'm not going to go, you know, past this. Um, and so I was like, I'd rather take a step back and just keep doing it socially from now on. So it just got a bit too much for what it was worth for, for, for me. But yeah. oh. I still still played and I'm looking to join a new team. So Yeah, beautiful. I guess um, yeah. I guess in regards to sort of um, still playing, which is the next question that I uh, – one that I'm really curious to hear your answer about actually is that um, I guess I see a lot of – people playing basketball yeah you know if you drive around town you see a lot more basketball facilities you know at playgrounds nowadays and at schools obviously where they leave the rings up hopefully for kids to shoot around at and uh, obviously even if I go to indoor venues you know where you can hire a court at the pool or stuff like that you'll see people playing basketball but it's all predominantly males okay I must say I I, you know it's 95 percent if not greater that you would see males and really rarely females playing basketball in a 
I don't know, in a bit of a hobby recreational sort of sense, I guess, is there something that, you know, maybe you can share here that sort of why it seems like there's so many little sort of females that are sort of just simply going out and playing at the playground or at the, the basketball courts at the pool and, and things like that? I feel like it's a very large mix of things. I know personally a lot of my, of all my female and male friends, my male friends would 100% go and kick a footy out on an oval. My female friends would never. So even though it's a stereotype, I feel like that is real for my circle of friends. Um, but I also know there are people like girls I know that don't really feel safe going into, you know, weightlifting dominated or um, gyms that just have more of a male crowd just from um, comments or unwanted male attention and just feeling uneasy about it all. Um, so it could be a mix of those things. People just might not, you know, want to play with the other gender. They might just want, you know, an all girls team or an all boys team or it might be. Yeah. So I feel like it's, it's a wide mix of things, but would you say that, I think, would yeah. you say that if you um you know if you went down or maybe you and a couple of girlfriends went down and played around at a you know the closest playground that has a ring outside that you might you you know you have or you think you might face some level of um you know guys come up to you and maybe you know be inappropriate or something along those sort of lines or there's some level of safety concerns is that sort of what maybe you're, you're sort of thinking I would not be worried only because in in those situations I know how to or I'm I'm overly confident in those situations um but I do know there would be a lot of my friends that would would never would not at all be because of that because you know if if people came and saw it would be it would be more of a thing to look at not really making much sense but it would be it would look unusual but I do think it's starting um breaking down those gender norms early in primary school would be so much better I think it was very much like boys do football and girls do netball and that's it and that was all the sports um and so I think once you break it down then then people would just be a lot more used to it and not think twice Hmm. it's um this is another detour question but it's quite interesting because you know you look at australia's history and performance of basketball and our female teams have always been far more successful on the olympic stage than the males have but when the males won the bronze medal last year it felt like we won the gold and uh, i guess i'm interested on your side of how does it feel that you know subpar achievement by male is more of a spectacle than you know ongoing excellence by the female team um, I think that's, it's, I don't know. I think it's very, it's still good for them because I think regardless of the gender, if there was a team that wasn't really performing that well and got an award, that is still something to be celebrated. Um, I don't, I don't really look at it as the male team is shining through when the females have been shining through the whole time. Um, I do think on that. With that specific example, it's standalone. Um, but I do think there are definite examples where, um, like, a guy could do, could make a shot and a woman's been making it the whole time and it's like, oh, my God, that was that was incredible. And it's kind of like, well, that's what the other girl was doing. Or, I like, generally, yes. But I think with that specific example, I do think just comp- comparatively, to their previous performances, it's still a still a good effort to get bronze. <laughs> I'm not trying to take away the bronze. I'm also on cold and flu, so that was yeah. a tangent a question that maybe didn't articulate. No, the way no, no, I was. <laughs> no, that's no, all good. I appreciate it. Um, obviously, the last one. Uh, I think we all have experience playing mixed basketball, uh, and obviously, there's modifications to the rules to uh, restrict scoring or to you know alternate who goes in the key or restrict people from going in the key. Uh, I guess. You know, Fauzi and I have our perspective on this because we typically have to shoot a lot of jumpers and, um, you know, try not to overly play too aggressive on the on the defensive side of things. But how do you find it uh, from your experience as a female? 
Um, from my experience, I selfishly, I loved it. The second they there were, it was a male dominated team in mixed and me and, you know, my two other friends could go into the key and we were, you know, we would outnumber them. It was fantastic. But it does really bug me that there were unequal um, playing, well, not like un unequal rules. So I think at the end of the day, you're playing based, like the teams are based on a skill mix. It's not three boys, two girls, you know, you're in this category. But if you have the other, not, well, like, I don't know, I think it was, I would just rather play everyone equal. Just normal Same basketball, yeah. Normal rules, normal basketball. Is that sort of what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I remember my first mixed game as an as an adult, the one of the um, opponents came up to me and was like, I don't even know how to defend a girl. And I was so offended. I thought, I'm just playing basketball. Stick your arms up. Like it's not, it's not rocket science. It's the same way you would defend a guy. And then that really got me thinking about the rules as well. And I thought, well, why, why am I allowed in some sections and why are they not? And just play netball if you want to do that. <laughs> I, it's, it's actually funny you mentioned that because I guess I got an extra question here too that. Um, I know you played obviously mixed basketball in domestic, okay, against guys that you said earlier. And I I know that I've coached teams, obviously my team's been all, all boys, obviously, that have played other teams that have been all girls in that Saturday competition because it's a mixed competition. That's how it's determined, <laughs> yeah, termed, yeah. Um, and one of my messages, I'll admit, as a coach here, has to be in no sort of game matchup is that, don't worry about their girls. They're basketball players. Let's just play basketball. That to me is the message I give as a coach here. And I guess mm. um, because often if you don't sort of just remind that message, they get all these ideas. Like you just said, this guy came up to you in a mixed game and said, I don't know how to defend you because what you're a female and mm. you know, what's the difference? There's no difference. You know, we're both everyone playing yeah. basketball here with the same rules, right? I guess yeah. from your side, you know, have you had that sort of in a domestic sort of situation or any sort of situations that really jumped to mind that that sort of same sort of you know situation occurred from the other side that how you know it was sort of really like you know like you said you got offended yeah I it really it really does bug me because you then you can tell when people are playing different because you're a female like my my male teammate would dribble the ball and the guy would be in his face and you know really playing good defense and I dribbled the ball and it was like, he was like, oh, good job. Well done. Just keep, keep coming down. I was like, how patronizing can you get? So that really does frustrate me when all of a sudden, because I'm a female, I'm not taken as seriously, but it was almost, it was a good thing for me because I got to just then, you know, use their underestimating me to my advantage. Um, but then it lasted half a game and then it was, oh, okay. She actually is just a basketball. Like it's not, you're not playing with like a three-year-old child. You don't have to be delicate or, you know, give them some space. So. I guess uh, I actually got one more question here in regards to, because I guess part of the whole, it was, you know, getting you uh, to come and share your experiences was the difference obviously between the two genders. And I guess you, talked about um you know obviously being treated differently on the court in a mixed game because you are female obviously and that the, the males would teach treat you differently were there sort of times where um guys overstepped the line is there maybe some a story that's you know sort of sticks in your head here that there was just maybe a male opposition player was totally inappropriate because simply you were a female basketball player even though we just all love playing basketball not for me personally, but I know my friend has been catcalled by the opposition during a game. And for me, that was just really disheartening because, I, because you know, like you all go and it's a, it's a fun thing to do. And I'm just like, well, this is one of the reasons why, like before, this is like you're, you're going to eradicate mixed gender sports if both genders can't feel safe playing. Um, so that was really frustrating. But not for me personally. Um, 
I think also I, like the second someone says something to me, I'll talk back. Like the guy was like, I can't, like, how do you play against a girl? I was like the same way you play against a boy. Like I'm not, I'm not here to just, I don't know, be treated differently. So yeah, luckily it hasn't been too bad for me though. <laughs> no, it makes sense. I guess it's probably helpful that you had all that junior experience as well playing with guys throughout the years. So I guess, you know, it sounds like when you've sometimes been faced with these situations, you've been able to sort of stand up for yourself, which is great to hear, I guess. So, um, yeah, good. I guess, um, yeah, you have any more questions? Nick? No, I think, um, I think it was a really great interview in terms of being able to like flow of natural things. I, I, I feel like I want to partially apologize because I feel like we've chucked more gender questions at you than a previous guest, but, um, no, I also that's... think that potentially it's a bit of a, it, it's, it's a bit of an advocacy for you. Um, and I totally agree with you. The, the gender norms at a primary age, uh, as someone who works in that sector, is uh, is going to take a while to undo. Uh, there's still a lot of embedded generational stereotypes that even if we feel more progressive, I think uh, it, it's still not there yet. Yeah, no, I love talking about gender norms and sexism and everything. So loved it. <laughs> loved cool. ranting. Well, look, thank you so much for coming online, Tori. And uh, you know, it was an absolute pleasure having you on our podcast. Thank you. It was lots of fun. Thanks Thank for having me.